third, and just announced, um, actually tomorrow, officially, is the Paul G. Silver Award and Medal from the American Geophysical Union. It is its highest award for the contributions to the research and careers of junior scientists and to the development of national earth science programs. Bob has also served on a plethora, literally a federal, state, and university review panels over many, many years. And finally, on a personal front, Bob was raised in Jackson and Logan, Utah. He is of proud Swiss pioneer heritage, resides in Moose and Salt Lake City. And so I'd like to ask you to join me in welcoming Dr. Bob Smith. Okay, guys, can you all hear me? Yes. yes. Well, thanks to the Charles and Jackson Hole and the community for inviting me. It's always fun to come and talk to you folks because you're always so interested in things that we do in our research, uh, Yellowstone, Teton, etc. I want to start out by saying I thought about a talk of work on Yellowstone Lake and that back in January-ish. And uh, I suggest that the title to, to John, the, <laughs> the website, but I'll be honest, since then there's so much that has happened that I'm going to tell you about everything in between and all about the new discoveries and new research we've done. And that's where these guys are going to listen to me, I guess. They come every year. <laughs> so I'm going to kind of focus on the new discoveries that we've made, particularly on the Yellowstone Blue, brand new data, and deformation and earthquakes that occurred in Noah's Geyser Basin back, 19, uh, back in 2014. It's kind of unprecedented deformation. So I'll try and follow this uh, volcano tectonic setting. I'll give you an introduction, talk about heat flow volcanoes, shaking earthquakes, and then talk about our new tomography studies of the mantle of the Yellowstone Plume and the new uplift data we have discovered and worked in Yellowstone. And I always end up about talking about earthquake and volcano hazards, but because you're such good friends, I'm going to show you some of my global uh, experiences around the world. So I want to first acknowledge the people who have supported me. As John mentioned, I started working in Yellowstone in 1956 out of high school, actually in the early spring. I thought I was going to go college, I had a chance to go to Yellowstone instead. But I was a GS zero, <laughs> and uh, maybe 0.5. And I, I followed this up, the studies of the Hebden Lake earthquake, right after it started, I was able to get up there, making sure we had friends and family who was alive. And now, 55 years of Yellowstone earthquake, volcano well, research alone, I'm still doing it. I want to point out, and John's mentioned the, the number of students and people I've collaborated with, with people from the National Park Service, NSF, USGS, a lot of other universities. And really, those are the folks that have helped me throughout this my whole career. Um, I'd love to actually hear your head to students. I'd like to see them. Um, 30 of which have done Yellowstone research and written all kinds of scientific papers now. But these are the people that have really supported me uh, throughout the whole program. This is my research group at the University of Utah. It's a combined geophysics and active tectonics group where we integrate information between the fields of geophysics geology. I formed the Yellowstone, uh, the University of Utah Seismograph Station uh, many years ago and still 
course, operate within that domain. The Park Service has been a great help to me. NSF has supported me for my whole career. Airscope, which I was one of the founders, has been supportive as well as the USGS. And of course, the also Volcano Observatory, which I helped found over 15 years ago. Uh, UNAVCO is a group of consortium of universities, which I helped form to do precise measurements of ground deformation along with seismology. I was, uh, I've been on the Teton Science School board since 1974. <laughs> Peter's here, it's fine to that. Because once you get on that board, you can't get off. I can tell them what you're tell. <laughs> Listen, I love that organization. <laughs> Very supportive. And I have two, I guess, support these two research foundations, which are independent, of course. Of government that allows me to really carry out much of my research. Now, many of you have heard the word supervolcano. I tend to use the word giant volcano, but the BBC folks, of course, put out this documentary in 19, 2004. They did actually a good job. We were consultants to them, and as I went through the probabilities of a giant eruption, I'll go through them with you as well at the end. Uh, these folks liked the whole idea, but they wanted to come out with, with something that showed the Yellowstone was eminently about to erupt. And that's where we parted ways. <laughs> well, just remember from your old class in geology, geology one, geophysics one, there are four basic elements in, in tech, plate tectonic theory. Transform fault, like the San Andreas. Subduction zones, like Cascades has got its own Pacific Northwest. PDF is one of the Fuca Plate, Pacific Plate. And excuse me, the lithosphere <coughs> extension, that's the whole basin of rain, including think you're playing the Yellowstone Teton region. And hot spots. And Yellowstone is our own hot spot in our backyard. And these three elements, excuse me, these four elements make up the basic concepts of the <coughs> underpinning, if you wish, of tectonics in a global sense. The interesting part of Yellowstone that is, you know, something like 1,200 kilometer miles away from the plate boundary. Most hot spots, as I'll show you, are on oceanic plates. Uh, we'll talk more about that. But one of the fortunate things about that is that it's accessible. We don't have to have a ship to drive around and do our studies as we do in oceanic settings. Well, a reminder that earthquakes are a very important feature. And uh, the switch here a bit. The Intermountain Seismic Belt, which I named back in 19, really, six, late 60s, extends from down to St. George up to the <coughs> central portion of Utah, paralleling these major faults. This is the Wasatch Fault. And then the earthquake belt extends to the northeast, swinging around through Jackson Hole, Yellowstone, the branch off toward central Idaho, and then dies out along the normal faults. You know, far north is Canadian border. Well, we named this the Intermountain Seismic Belt, and uh, rightly so. It's a dominant feature if you look at any earthquake map. Of course, we're not on a plate boundary, so we don't have the high rates of seismicity that we get, for example, on the San Andreas, but we certainly have uh, a lot of ongoing activity. Here's the detailed map of earthquakes. This is actually through 2013. The map looks the same if I put it through 2015. This diffuse zone of earthquakes comes up from Star Valley into southern Jackson Hole, and then it swings out to the east into the Grovons, Lighty Highlands, and off to the west. I, uh, in my early career, I came up to put seismographs all along the Teton Fault, fully expecting there were going to be a lot of earthquakes. To my surprise, there were none. Well, the Teton <coughs> Fault occupies a seismic gap, meaning it's on an active fault that has ruptured multiple times in, uh, of course, late in the quaternary, and uh, will continue. So it's a gap in that sense. But I'm not going to dwell on the Teton region. I'm going to dwell on Yellowstone. Yellowstone has this interesting band of earthquakes that comes from the Madison Valley in Montana, swinging through the West Yellowstone Basin. And there are two active faults here, the Red Canyon Fault and the Hebgen Fault. And the Hebgen Fault Fault ruptured multiple, multiple, if you wish, in 1959, 
in a magnitude 7.3. Now, why that's important? That is a big earthquake. It was a deadly earthquake. It killed 28 people. This band of earthquakes comes into Yellowstone, and then it breaks up into these individual, if you wish, trends that extend north-south, roughly. And uh, they come down through the Yellowstone Plateau. And uh, I'm going to show you later that we think this one right here is an extension of the Teton Fault, which is now covered by the beautiful volcanics of the Yellowstone system. Well, Yellowstone is really an interconnected system. You cannot study one thing without studying the other. And this is my whole philosophy of research. And that is how you put things together and how one active process affects another. So mantle plumes are the basis of hot spots, and they produce heat, heat flux, that produce the hydrothermal volcanic features of the surface. The mantle plume produces fluids. Buoyancy produces ground deformation that relates to earthquakes, and vice versa. So all of these arrows in here are double arrows, because everything fits together. And here's a general story I'm going to go through. We're showing you the newest data on the Yellowstone plume and this young volcanic center, if you wish, a very shallow magma body beneath Yellowstone today. There's a wall of that feature. And this is what we call the Yellowstone Crustal Magma Reservoir. And this body inflates and deflates depending upon the rate of influx and release of fluids. But when it does that, it produces ground deformation. Now, I'm going to go a lot more detail. This is a Looks like a banded colored cartoon. Indeed, that's what it is. It's a contour map of uplift that we recorded up through 2014. Every ring here is a birefringence ring. This is from INSAR data, satellite data. Superimposed are the GPS vectors, vertical meaning that the ground motion is up. So we integrate GPS and INSAR data together in real time. Well, Yellowstone's always moving, shaking, baking, cooking away. And you folks who have seen my talks before know that I depend upon this whole concept that earthquakes and deformation are closely related in the Yellowstone system. So on the left, I plotted a number of earthquakes by quartile along this axis. And uh, I'm differentiated as we got more and more data in the difference between lone earthquakes and swarms of earthquakes were shown in blue. But you can see Yellowstone is a very active system. It had a very large earthquake swarm in 1985 and 86, and it has had many <coughs> swarms since then. The most recent was a 2010 swarm uh, on the west side of the Calder of my own faithful. And I'm showing here the deformation pattern. Fortunately, when they built the roads in Yellowstone, they established the first survey of the benchmarks. So we resurveyed these benchmarks in 1975 and 76, and we saw that the Yellowstone Caldera for this 50 years or more had been rising at almost an inch per year. It accelerated to this period of time right here. Now there was a seismic network in Yellowstone, but the USGS turned it off, and for lack of interest or funds, then they came to us and said, Bob, this is a very important thing. Would you please take it over? And I said, only if you operate it at Yellowstone Intermountain Standards, not California Standards, because we have winter seven months of the year, and we have to have a much different kind of instrumentation, et cetera, et cetera. That's a long story. And we record the data in real time. I'll talk more about it. But nonetheless, this is the data from the GPS and leveling showing the uplift that peaked in 19. 83, 84, and the caldera went down. And I'm also plotting data from outside the caldera. It was going up. So roughly when the caldera is going down, outside the caldera it's going up. And then we had this acceleration of uplift in 2004, which continued for several years. We'll talk about that. And then it went down, and we're sitting right over here right now. I'll show you not very much happening. But this is the story of the ups and downs of Yellowstone that reflects the processes that give rise to deformation, earthquakes, and if you wish to bolt this, moving, shaking, and baking. Now, I was not the first person, nor any of us, that were out here that really recognized some of these features. And Doug was a lieutenant, and he uh, led a lot of the early geologists, and led some of the early geologists in Yellowstone. And, uh, 
he has an interesting history. He was out of Fort Ellis at the time, which was then he was east of Bozeman. When he came into the Yellowstone country, but he made the observation that he writes in his memoirs as a country for sightseers, it is well parallel. As a field for scientific research, it promises great results in the branches of geology, mineralogy, botany, zoology, and ornithology. That was not ecology. <laughs> and he says it's probably the greatest laboratory that nature purges on the surface of the globe. <clears throat> so he was very forward looking, and he got it right. And he didn't have all the fancy instruments we have now. And of course, I'm showing you a cross section of the Yellowstone volcanic field. Uh, Canyon, Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone, and I'll uh, talk more about that as we go along. Yellowstone, of course, is the youngest feature of a track of silicic volcanism that began over here about 17 million years ago, 16 and a half. And I'm plotting here by circles centers of, vol of volcanism, not individual features, but centers of individual or groups of volcanic uh, features, calderas, ash flow that are dominantly silicic, rhyolites, tufts, 16, 16, and they're in millions of years, 14, 12, 11, 10, 7, 6, 4, 2, 1, 0. 0.6, which of course is the track of a hotspot. No, it is not the track of a hotspot, it's the track of the North American plate, which is moving at roughly 2 centimeters per year to the southwest across a fixed source of volcanism in the Earth's mantle. So if you want to go through the physics of these kind of things, imagine this as being the bow wave in your boat the next time you're out on Jackson Lake. And in fact, that's what it is. It's a bow wave of stress as the plate moves across the hot spot. And where that bow wave has the highest stress is where we have this concentration of earthquakes in this tectonic parabola that I've named and used to demonstrate this feature is a major feature of Western US seismicity related to this progression of young volcanic features, if you wish, going up the Snake River Plain. Well, just to remind you that volcanic eruptions uh, can be large and small. I'm not going to go through the very detail, except that many of you remember Mount St. Helens erupted in 1980. And the actual eruption of Ashraelian was 0.3 cubic kilometers. That's actually very, very small, but of course, it affected a very highly populated area. It killed 60 people, and of course the ash flows were disgorged down the rivers and caused a great deal of flooding. Well, in 1991, there was a major eruption of Pinatubo volcano in the Philippines, and this is an aerial taken of that feature, seven cubic kilometers. So as you can see, it's 20 times larger than, than St. Helens. But you can actually see a great deal of the features here. You can see this is the caldera feature itself, the pothole remaining after the top of the mountain was blown away. So you can imagine this mountain actually, from the sides here, went up across the top, came down. It was a large peak. And these pyroclastic flows were killed or distributed over hundreds of miles in the Philippines and uh, as much as 40, 50 centimeters deep. 60 kilometers from the volcano. It killed 700 plus people, including <coughs> doing a great deal of damage to Clark Air Force Base. Well, a typical Yellowstone eruption, after the giant caldera eruptions, had been five to 10 times larger than Pinatubo. That's the takeaway. So Yellowstone has the capability, and we have the record, of course, this feature, Yellowstone volcanism is very important. And I tried to show that by plotting here the volume of the material that came out of Mount St. Helens. That's this little cube right here. Here's Mount Pinatubo I just showed you in the Southwest Pacific, or in the Philippines. Krakatau in 1883, 4.3 cubic miles. Mount Lizama, also in the Southwest Pacific, 6,800 years ago. Tambora, 1815, 3.6. And here's Yellowstone. And the combined total here is roughly 8,000 cubic miles of eruptive material. The oldest being the Yellowstone eruption of 2 million years ago. And erupted this hard rock equivalent of 600 cubic miles. 
The next younger is the Island Park region, 70, and it was only 1.3 million years ago. The youngest, which we call the Yellowstone, 630,000 years ago, 240 cubic miles. So this is a very active feature. Here's a map. And by the way, these most of these documents are from my book and the early material of the history, but you can see that if you wish. Uh, the Huckleberry Ridge Tuff, the darker brown, is this one right here. And it covered, or it's been seen over an area, as you can see, much of the western US. And now it's even mapped in a wider scale, seen in the Gulf of Mexico and in the eastern US, and also throughout the Pacific. The next youngest volcano right here, you can see that this is the, the youngest volcano, the Yellowstone Caldera eruption. It had a smaller, of course, but it still had an immense effect on a large area of the western U.S. And just to show you the relative size of Mount St. Helens ash flow came out along this pattern. And in this area right here was only one or two millimeters. In the case of here, it was several to shoot several meters. Well, so here's the time sequence. There's the original Caldera 1, 2.06 million years. Here's Caldera 2, the Island Park Caldera, now is known as the Henry's Fort Caldera. And Caldera 3 is the Yellowstone Caldera. And I've put the inter-event times here in blue. So the time between this eruption and this eruption was 800,000 years here, 660,000 years. And the time since the last eruption, we haven't had the third, the fourth one, 640,000 years. But the average of these injury event times is 700,000 years, roughly. And if you believe in this stuff, that means we're 70,000 years away. But here's my proviso. The statistics of only two numbers, namely this number and this number, the interruption times. You can't take this number because it has interrupted. They're highly misleading. You would do my stock on the basis of two observations <laughs> or two documented uh, times in the stock market, of course you would. So we do not know from this information how close we are to the next super eruption. Yes, I'll ask you, we, John, we do not know when the next eruption will be, and I don't have a clue. But I do know that volcanism has not stopped at Yellowstone. I'll show you more about that. <laughs> well, the Yellowstone hotspot is a feature that's dominated by this high Yellowstone plateau. And this Yellowstone plateau basically stands about 500 meters above the surrounding terrain. And it's not just Yellowstone National Park. It includes a whole region outside of Yellowstone. But here's the Teton Range. Teton Fall, it ends at Yellowstone. The Gallatin Range ends at Yellowstone. The Madison Range ends at Yellowstone. On the east side, the Absaracas, 45 million euros. They're not part of this Yellowstone story. And of course, this is the uh, Sharon area, again, terminated as north side. And they're terminated, in this case, by Caldera 3 boundary. Caldera 2 is mapped over here. And while Caldera 1 has been covered by most of the young ejecta, we can see the south boundary, the north side of the Tetons, toward the island park, and you can actually see it on parts of the northern boundary. But it's not that well documented. Well, the reason I'm saying this is because this feature on the north side at Madison Junction, if you drive in or fly in from the Fire Hole River, this is the boundary right here. That's the fault that dropped the inner portion of the Caldera down from original location up here. But there was a fault that cut off the Gallatins right here in the first caldera eruption. And if you like to swim in the fire hole or fish in the fire hole, this, if you go to the parking lot right there at the north and excuse me, the south end of the fire hole road and look back at the rocks instead of the great fishing or swimming, you'll see these exposures of these dominant rhyolite flows, which like they just flowed out of your frying pan, or if you wish, from your hot cake pan, and they drape themselves over existing topography. There are a lot of breaches. There's a lot of inner column, inner flow deformation. You can see the very few centimeter thick flows. 
of material. And why is this important? Because rhyolite flows are different than basalt flows. They're different than the Snake River Plain. They're different than the basalts of the oceans. Rhyolites are about a million times more viscous than basalt, meaning they resist flow at a much higher rate or a higher value, which means it takes a lot more pressure to deform them or to load them with magma beneath them. So that means they get much more pressurized before they finally explode. And now I give you the question, why do we always drive uphill the Yellowstone? <laughs> I'm serious. You cannot go anywhere around the Yellowstone hotspot and not drive uphill to get to the Yellowstone. In this direction, this direction, this direction. You're always going uphill. And I'm asking you this question rhetorically. You know? I think you'll figure out by the end of my talk why. Well, again, there were, Lieutenant Doan was a very great observer, and he was up with Lake Butte on the east side of Yellowstone Lake. And we're looking to the east. Uh, Washburn's over here, the Lake Hotel would be right in here. This is Little Hill, this ridge back here is called the Elephant Back Fall Zone. Sour Creek Research Dome is this higher zone of hills to the north of Fishing Bridge. Well, why is this hill here, and why is it cut off? Because it's a caldera mountain. In other words, that's the fault that dropped the whole system in, just like the one I showed you over at Madison Junction. Well, as Don says, from the summit of Mount Washburn, Don surmised the entire basin may be obtained with the mountain surrounding on every side. The Great Basin has been formed in one vast crater of an extinct volcano. It might be called one vast crater out of which fluid interior, the fluid interior of the earth, and its fragments of rocks, volcanic dust, and unlimited quantities. Well, he had it right on, and some of this work that he did further encouraged uh, the, excuse me, the Hayden surveys, and uh, I'll talk more about those early geologic surveys. Hayden was the first little geological survey of Yellowstone in the 1870s. Now, Yellowstone has faults and flows and hydrothermal systems. This is a map showing all of the hydrothermal systems. Hydrothermal systems mean geysers, hot springs, fumaroles, mud pots. And you can see they're dominantly within the caldera number three. Starting over here in the upper geyser basin, the old fable, the lower geyser basin, and the upper northeast part of Yellowstone. But here's the big one. This is called Hot Springs Basin. It's the biggest hot spring basin in, known on land in the world. I'll show you a slide or two of it. It's a long ways away in, 20, 25 miles remote. Then there's a sequence of hot spring systems that continues north along what we call the Mammoth Corridor, and then again, of course, Mammoth Hot Springs. This is the Norris system itself. Well, where does this fluid come from that gives rise to the hot springs in the magmatic system? Well, heat must come from deep within the earth. There's waters of high salinity at a depth of about one to two kilometers, and these things circulate within fractured rock within the uppermost crust, like convection cells in your coffee pot. They in turn heat through conduction and convection, the meteoric waters that come from, of course, rainfall, snowfall, and these are the waters that we see returning to the earth as hot springs and geysers. So this whole system basically derives its origin on the basis of a hot system down here. And that's what we talk more and more about. I'm not a specialist in hydrothermal features, but that, of course, is what they mean. But I do know, of course, that you will have, you both love to go visit Old Faithful. Came in the winter of 1974 about 60 below zero with Rick Hutchinson. There's Guardian Geyser, the Geyser Basin, Beehive Geyser, the erupts uh, rather continuously, same general area. Some of the Yellowstone's important geysers. But why is it important? Well, here's the upper geyser basin. This is Old Faithful. Again, this was taken in the middle of winter. We were flying back from Bozeman to Salt Lake, as I recall. And you can see in the outline to the left side of the aircraft this dome of high topography. This is the Mallard Lake Resurgent Dome. It's a dome that has been risen or raised 
by an inflow by magma, which holds it high compared to the surrounding terrain. And in the middle of this is a valley called the Robin, and its north side is right here. I tried to depict it in this picture, and the south side is right here. Why is this important? Because this Mallard Lake known fault system comes into the central portion of the caldera, fractures the ground, allows high rates of percolation and <coughs> circulation in the very shallow hydrothermal system. And here's Grand Prismatic Hot Springs, and here's Excelsior Geyser, which last erupted in 1888. Well, these all owe their origin to a highly fractured system, but I argue to continuation of earthquakes that keeps the plumbing open for these hot spring systems. Well, I've had some interesting experiences, and this is one that I truly remember well. I was a pilot, and we were flying in Yellowstone. Uh, West Yellowstone, we're out of fuel, we're out of fuel, we've been flying with National Geographic folks. And uh, turned to the left to go to West Yellowstone, looked to the right and said, whoa, there's something going on at Norris. We flew straight to Norris. We had four pictures left of my crummy camera. Geographic photographer shot 30, 30 rolls, and he was done. And we had about uh, five, six pounds of fuel on board. But I said, we had to go look. And of course, it was an eruption of Steve Geyser, wow. the world's tallest geyser. And you can see, this is the steamboat itself. The parking lot is here. And the lower portion here, the first three to 400 feet, is actually high velocity jets of steam. And then you get into more drier steam and finally into a mist, and we turn through the mist. Look at the size of these trees for scale. We went back uh, that afternoon, and these trees that we looked at specifically are 50 to 75 feet high. So this eruption of this system was very, very unusual. At the time I was there, it erupted about once every five to 10 years. <coughs> and it erupted for 20 to 30 minutes. And how lucky could I have been to capture a look like this to see this amazing creature? And I calculated the probability it was one in 150 million that I got there to take that picture. Now, <clears throat> kind of like winning the California Tower of World Lottery, but I think this is a much better payoff. <laughs> he drives it all. Yellowstone is driven by heat. We'll talk about more where it comes from. This is a map showing by color codes the heat flux. We don't measure temperature, we measure the amount of heat that comes out per square meter. We call it heat flow. And you can see that the areas to the east of the Yellowfoot, you wish the intermountain seismic belt in the stable North America have relatively low values, 50, 60, 80. And as you come into the basin of range, they get 90, 100, 110, and higher. Well, the average heat flow is roughly 50 to 60 milliwatts per square meter in North America. And the average in Yellowstone, on the other hand, is about 2,000. That's about 30 to 40 times the total, or the average of the whole top. If you calculate that the total heat re release is 6 gigawatts, now that's a lot of power. It's about this amount of heat that's released when you take a tenth of a cubic kilometer of basaltic magma and let it cool. You can release roughly that much equivalent energy in gigawatts. Well, it's a very active system. And right within Yellowstone, this is a map showing by far the heat flow value. And down here in the south end of Yellowstone Lake, you see 150, 500 up around Mary Bay, 35,000, west of 2,000. The integrated value here in the upper and lower geyser basins in Norris is 60,000, 42,000, 40,000. These actual individual hydrothermal areas release an enormous amount of heat, but it's concentrated in the geyser of the hot spring system itself. So. Well, I tend to spend a lot of time in Yellowstone. I have just been giving a lecture in Boise, and I brought 30 people from the Earth Scope meeting in Boise. We traveled the state river plane in Yellowstone. And of course, we were doing a field trip throughout the entire park. We came to the Midway Geyser Basin, 
And we took a walk across the bridge there. And this is what the area of Wall Pool and the area of Biscuit Basin looks like. Look how nice and calm. There's the scale of about half a meter to uh, dimension of bryolite. I had one of my graduate students, two of them actually. I had just given a lecture and I said, earthquakes are rare and volcanoes are rare. These things are really rare. And Hank Cutchin, or excuse me, Hank Eastwood, the park geologist, had just given a lecture and he was just saying, and excuse me, hydrothermal eruptions and explosions are very rare. <laughs> so all these people had their cameras out taking pictures, I thought of me. This thing went off. I literally thought there was a truck or an explosion coming across the bridge. It was in a rare eruption of Biscuit Basin, May 17, 2009. And you can see the ejecta coming out of that feature. These are rocks which we later were not measured. They're three to four inches in diameter. You can see the water surge coming right here out of the system as it exploded. It flowed rapidly toward the fire hole. That's what this thing looks like. And it reminds us that it's a very energetic feature. So I heard that blast, and I said to myself, you got to think fast in this situation. Should I run? Should I get my camera and out of my pack, which is where it is most of the time? Or should I save my companions? Fortunately, the wind was actually blowing a little bit from left to right, and it blew the ejecta away from us. And it was over literally the matter of three to four seconds. But that was a pretty amazing experience for you. But again, I kind of thought it was a probability. <laughs> One in a million. You got to bet on me or with me? And I've already told you this story, and I won't spend time on that. Let me go on to how we measure Yellowstone. We have a network of seismographs showing here up to the left, the triangles, and GPS units you know, over here. And I'll go through all the detail. We have now 37 seismograph stations. And these data are telemetered in real time to the University of Utah where they're recorded. And they're put onto the web within literally milliseconds. So you can get the same data. Our <coughs> GPS array consists of 26 permanent GPS systems that are active to a few millimeters per year of deformation. And so all of these data make up the Yellowstone monitoring system. It's all real time and available to the public. I should say, this is a big project. We've got probably $4 million of instrumentation uh, installed over the last decade, including the data for the Earth scope stations. I'll talk about LIDAR later. But I want to say all the data are transmitted in real time, and they're available online to anyone, meaning you. And I'll talk right at the end about how you can get it if you haven't tried it. This is a typical seismograph. This is a record of earthquakes recorded for a 124 hour period at a station at Madison Junction, actually, at Madison Canyon. And each line here is 15 minutes between the black here, one hour. And so this is like a revolving drum, but this is done, of course, on our computer system. We have expended a great deal of time and effort. I want to tell people, we spend as much time and effort on our central recording facility as we do on the, the field recording. And no one really appreciates this. To get these kind of data is an enormous amount of effort. I have seven full-time people that work with me on this whole system to keep all of this running, keep the computational facility running. This is a GPS station at Canyon. And uh, this is the GPS receiver. This is not one you buy at RBI. This is one. Of the, this is one. <laughs> these are called genetic receivers, and they're accurate to a few millimeters per year of motion. They're actually accurate to about three or four fingernail widths of deformation measurements. Uh, at the time we first put these in, they were thirty-five thousand dollars a piece. They're now down to fifteen thousand. There, the data are recorded. We have an invar steel rod that's driven in about two meters of the bedrock, and on top of it is the GPS receiver with this little radar device on top to exclude extraneous data. Again, all these data are real time and they're all available via the net. Well, Ferdinand Hayden was this famous geologist that came out in the 1870s, and he was the first person to really record 
document some of the earthquake information was kept on this little bluff, Steeple Point, north end of Yellowstone Lake. This is Lake Butte. I'm showing you a picture from there. This is the little bluff that sticks out to Sedge Bay on the left, Mary Bay on the right. And this was called Earthquake Camp because literally the earthquakes were occurring hundreds per day and night so bad, or so bad, so good if you wish, that it was shaking and they couldn't sleep. Mm -hmm. By the way, there's the odometer they used to pull behind a horse to measure the distances and to create the first topic well, the first maps of Yellowstone. <coughs> I happened to be a student in, in 1959, and uh, we had the occurrence of the Hebgen Lake earthquake. Mm. And this is a picture I took about three days after the earthquake. This is the Hebgen Lake fault scars, 5.7 meters high. Now that's one geology student, two geology students, three geology students, 22 feet of vertical offset of a normal fault. I want you to remember this. This is the kind of fault the Teton fault is. <coughs> it's a vertical displacement. It is not a transform or horizontal fault, which you get in California. These are called normal faults, not that they're average. That's the name, it's a dip slip fault. 28 people were killed, documented. Another body was just discovered and the Absarag is caught in a glacier, in two of the glaciers that came out and was dated to the person who was there. There were two people, one person, these people, one person was killed, and one person was, was, had fallen. And his partner came back out, told people, and they couldn't recover his body. He just recovered three years ago. <laughs> Nonetheless, this is a big earthquake, and it's very deadly. Here's a picture of Derek, Charlie Craighead. A lot of you know these guys. They were working there with their father and their uncle, and this is the kind of death of landslides that you get from this earthquake, particularly in Madison Canyon, 17 miles from the epicenter. And the roads are closed, and they remain closed in Yellowstone for two weeks. These were hard to get out in 1959. And when the, <coughs> this triggered a large landslide at the mouth of Madison Canyon, and for it backed up the water, produced quite a lake. So this is probably the largest mapped landslide in the United States. It's actually about the same size as the Rowan slide, but this was 1959. Of course, the Rowan slide was 1923, comparable size and devastation. Point is, these are the kind of earthquakes that we will normally have throughout the Intermountain region, Yellowstone, and Jackson Hole. Well, I showed you this earthquake map, earthquakes that come in from the west, create this cloud of seismicity. On this map, by the way, there's 45 earthquakes plotted, so don't worry about individual dots. Uh, this cloud of earthquakes comes from the Hebgen Lake aftershock area into the Norris area and then breaks up into these linear zones that extend to the south within the caldera. 1975, we had a magnitude 6.1 in Norris in the Norris area, actually in the Gibbon area, that caused clo road closure and a fair amount of damage. But nonetheless, the Yellowstone Plateau has experienced the largest historic event within the western U.S. interior. Now, originally it was a magnitude 7.5. We now have new data. It's actually about a 7.3 with the new unified global magnitude scale. But I've also plotted on here the outline of the youngest Yellowstone caldera. I plotted also in these star patterns the post-caldera